Ah, g'day mate, Forty here. So what do you think was going on with the social media accounts of uh, those people who stormed Capitol Hill on January 6th, right? What what do you think uh, they were posting about? And if there turns out to be a correlation between posting about uh, allegations of voter fraud or posting about QAnon and other right-wing conspiracy theories, and then antisocial behavior, is it any wonder that some people want to stigmatize this type of expression in effect to use a, a broad overgeneralization that many people want to effectively uh, ban Nazis from the public square? So here's a story out of uh, UCLA. So this UCLA student, he stormed Capitol Hill January 6th, And this picture shows him in the presiding officer's chair inside the United States Senate chambers. And the LA Times story headline, before far-right UCLA student stormed Capitol, he faced furor over incendiary tweets. Now, I am virtually a free speech absolutist, and I believe that for every, you know, thousand people posting incendiary tweets, you know, fewer than uh, 0.1% of them will ever commit a crime related to their posting. So I I don't believe there's some sort of inevitable connection between posting incendiary material on Twitter and participating in criminal behavior. On the other hand, I don't believe that uh, the online world and the real world are completely separate. I believe that the online world is part of the real world, and what you do online does affect how you behave in real life. So March 2020, there was a UCLA student, a leftist, Matthew Richard, went on Twitter. I value truth immensely. Um, I also value freedom and equality. And I think that we have a lot of the norms of public speech and behavior that reinforce kind of oppressive structures of domination and, 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 and exploitation. And that... In order to, you know, in order to give people the kind of like dignity and respect as democratic equals that they deserve. We- okay, so this is philosopher Will Wilkinson talking to Robert Wright, essentially making the case for censorship of uh, of Nazis and uh, white nationalists and the like. You have to enforce certain norms about what's okay to say in public. Um, like, and that's actually a condition for all of us to have meaningful freedom. Um, and that now I, I disagree with him, but what I want to investigate here is. Why do people believe as he does? So I don't think it's necessary to have these norms to stigmatize discussion of certain controversial issues to maintain freedom in our republic. But I want to investigate why people like Will Wilkinson think this way. So in March 2020, UCLA student Matthew Richard went on Twitter, called for the university to investigate and expel fellow undergraduate Christian Secor. And he posted a thread with 21 recent tweets from the account of Christian Secor, who founded America First Bruins, a far-right student group. Anyone else cop the Hitler sneakers, one tweet read. And another tweet, can ICE just cough on illegals or something? Outrage followed. Students complained to administrators. More than 30,000 people liked a Twitter post by one student who asked, you all think UCLA can expel someone for xenophobia? and wishing death upon undocumented people during a pandemic. Well, UCLA can't. 
Now, Christian Secor was arrested on Tuesday last week, charged with federal crimes for his alleged role in the U.S. Capitol Hill riot. So he was identified as having sat in the chair that Vice President Mike Pence had just vacated. He was 22 years of age, and he stirred up tensions over free speech at UCLA. So a president of UCLA's undergraduate students... Association Council Naomi Riley said this was not some random act that occurred. Him showing up at the Capitol was not out of the ordinary. It was very in line with what has been going on with that organization. So if there's a type of politics that is associated with antisocial behavior or low achievement or just uh, icky behavior that may not be criminal, then it's not shocking that there will be widespread opposition to this type of thinking. Christian Secor's Twitter feed offers a window into the increasingly explosive topic of free speech rights and extremist speech on American college campuses. So apparently Christian Secor was a follower of Nicholas Fuentes, host of the America First podcast, who practices white nationalism under a mainstream gift wrap. The now defunct America First Bruins Twitter account had as its background a benefiting communists aren't people. His Twitter account called fascism epic and, quote, valorizes the 2017 Charlottesville Tiki Torch March in Virginia, which featured an anti-Semitic chant. Jews will not replace us. Free speech experts who reviewed the thread Richard had posted said Secor's tweets were protected speech. And in an interview published last May with the conservative podcast host, Christian Secor discussed his own views on free speech. I don't support complete free speech. He said, I don't think communism should be legal. He says, anarchists and communists are the proponents of hate speech. So Christian Secor once belonged to Bruin Republicans. Then uh, he left it and started America First Club. And uh, got a lot of blowback. This is Extremely dangerous what this student is promoting, said Richard, who belongs to several leftist student groups. I was scared. We had a lot of events and we had a lot of agitators at our events on campus. So America First, Bruins and the Bruin Republicans endorsed an open letter asking then-President Trump to institute an indefinite moratorium on immigration to the U.S. due to the pandemic and to rededicate his efforts on the U.S.-Mexico border wall. Sounds uh, reasonable to me. Grayson Peters published an op-ed in Ha'am. That's a UCLA Jewish newspaper that began, Fascists are organizing at UCLA. All right, so what exactly is the case that uh, these people want to make for essentially banning Nazis from the public square? So there's an economics blogger, Noah Smith. And uh, he wrote, I think Americans dramatically underrate how much better life would be without Nazis around. So what the hell is he talking about? All right, so let's, let's just allow him to, to make his case and uh, try, to, try to understand where he's coming from. By Nazis, I do not mean Republicans or conservatives or Trump supporters or people with racist attitudes in general. I specifically mean Hardcore, passionate white supremacists for whom white supremacist activism is a lifestyle. This is a relatively small fringe. Most racists don't make a lifestyle out of it. So the the old saw about white nationalists in the United States is that they are one-third criminals, one-third homosexuals, and one-third uh, Nazis. So when you've got a group, let's say that what it's standing for is completely rationally defensible and you can make a good moral defense for it. But the overwhelming majority of people who participate in the movement or who publicly represent the movement seem to be disreputable characters, people with criminal backgrounds, people with antisocial personalities. Then is it any wonder that normies want nothing to do with them? Noah Smith writes, even though Nazis are a small fringe in America, they are a fractal fringe. Fractal, that's a... That's a mighty big word. So what the hell does fractal mean? Fractal. Fractal. Okay, it's a curve or geometric figure. I'm not sure that uh, fractal here really helps us understand, but uh, 
I think what he means is that they have that they make a lot of noise. So I'm not sure the word fractal really helps us though. So they branch out and ramify. Wow, there's another big word. Ramify. I believe that's to to make uh, ramify to form branches or offshoots. They spread and branch out. They grow and develop in complexity and range. Okay, so mighty big words here. They branch out and ramify and flow into any space that allows them. The 1980s, the Nazi fringe tried to be part of the punk subculture. Punks responded by punching Nazis in the face and kicking them out of the subculture. Nazis have tried to be part of the black metal subculture. Black metal fans responded by systematically excluding them. Gamer culture has also tried to kick out infiltrating Nazis with less success. And Nazis successfully infiltrated and destroyed 4chan. So if all you know about someone is that they post on 4chan, you immediately assume that they are pro-social, anti-social, or you make no assumptions. Seems to me that probably most people who post spend a lot of time reading 4chan, most likely anti-social. Noah Smith writes, the lesson is that Nazis will relentlessly infiltrate anywhere the powers that be fail to expel them with extreme prejudice. They will infiltrate your web forum. They will infiltrate your blog comments. They will go anywhere where they are not forcibly expelled. Once they are allowed in a space, they will make it awful for everyone else in that space, like a single rat turd floating in your, in your jar of uh, cereal. And uh, here's an argument that uh, any movement that preaches intolerance and persecution must be outside the law. As paradoxical as it may seem, this is defending tolerance. Defending tolerance requires to not tolerate the intolerant. So this is uh, Noah Smith's line of argumentation. The lesson the punks and metalheads learn is ban the Nazis, things just get better. Yes, it can feel intolerant, but that's the paradox of tolerance. He concludes, I suspect most people vastly underestimate how much better America as a whole will get when our current crop of Nazis finally gives up and goes away. So, does that... Uh... That is actually, but, and I think that this doesn't harm in any sense, the search for truth, um, because more... Now that's absurd to say, oh, if you say anything that might cause some group to feel oppressed, right? Feelings of oppression, these are entirely subjective, that that doesn't harm the search for truth. That's an absurd argument here by Will Wilkinson. Egalitarian norms that make it easier for um, people who haven't had the same chances as, you know, Anglo white guys like us, uh, or I don't know if you're Anglo, maybe you're German, I don't know. But like, <laughs> white guys, the, the Irish part of me is the non-Anglo part. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So like, I just don't like, like, I, I think that, like a lot of woke norms or what people think of as political correctness, I see as trying to elevate people who've been pushed down. And for me, as like somebody who cares a lot about the discovery of new knowledge, technological innovation and economic growth, I think one of the biggest tragedies in the history of the world is hierarchical social structures that have prevented everyone from contributing, from developing their capacities and contributing all of their talents to the enterprise of the discovery of knowledge and the invention of new technology. We would be vastly richer. You know, if you get the compounding logic of economic growth in your head, if, if we... Okay, I, I think that's absurd to believe that the primary reason that underachieving groups have underachieved is because of free speech. Had, you know, women's equality, racial equality 100 years earlier, we'd be vastly richer than we are today. And I see the norms that some people see as oppressive as being conducive to the kind of equality that brings the best out of everybody and lifts everybody up. Um, and even like even in my market fundamentalist way, even if like you're just thinking about it in terms of like, I want people to do science so that they can figure out how the world works so that they can make technologies that can make us rich, right? Like that means I want like black girls to get an amazing education. That's what that means, right? Like, and, and, and if they are gonna feel demeaned and demoralized if people can talk about them in certain ways um, and that's gonna keep that from happening, I think that's an outrage. Um, and like, I don't, so I don't actually see my, my, so like, I don't think that what they think is oppressive and the threat to freedom is, um, and, and I think that's a, a big part of the disconnect, but they're very sure it is. And they think because the New York times represents a certain viewpoint that they think, um, tends to suppress the kind of diversity of thinking that they think is necessary for free flowing debate and discovery. Like they have an antagonistic attitude towards those kind of institutions. Yeah. It's funny. Well, Matt, uh, Iglesias in his, uh, newsletter piece on this talked about the tension between the kind of attitude the rationalists want to cultivate and the kind of read the room sensibility, right? These guys are like against reading the room. And I got to say, like Robin Hanson, I kind of inferred that he was not capable of reading the room, but maybe, I mean, you know, he has said some things that it's like, no, 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 you're, Robin, stop. <laughs> Let me say yeah. you the, the amount of trouble you're going to get into. I don't know if he's, and I think some of them may actually be like that. I mean, there is a certain amount of this kind of in Silicon Valley in particular, not that that's where he is, but a, a kind of 
not room reading, but there's, I think Matt was also talking about a kind of a, a, an intentional opposition to reading the room. I mean, uh, for example, like, uh, you know, Charles Murray, if I happen to agree with Charles Murray on something unrelated to race, I would probably just to stay on the safe side, find somebody else I agreed with on that subject to cite instead of Charles Murray, right? That's kind of like, like in a way, uh, some would say a, a hypersensitive reading the room uh, sensibility, but it, it's what a lot of people would do. And I, and I think, you know, Matt was saying these people are very against that. And I think for some of them, not reading the room becomes an end in itself, right? Yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, like, like, like and, and, that, and that's how you get this kind of like, a kind of slippery slope from just completely anodyne, good-hearted, um, absolutist liberal toleration for an unfettered marketplace of ideas uh, to um, a kind of like bad faith right-wing shit stirring where they like will, will be like, you know, like they'll say something overtly sexist or overtly racist, or at least just like it's clear what they're getting at, but they just have enough possible deniability. And if you're like, dude, that's a little racist. They're just like, oh, I can't even like, I can't even have a conversation about like difficult mm -hmm. issues. Like, like, right. Like, and, and, and they're doing that not because they're actually being shut down, right? Like, they're consciously provoking a reaction so that they can blame the other side for being censorious and repressive because they actually do have bad illiberal ideas and people who can delegitimize those ideas get in their way. So if they can delegitimize them first as the people who are hostile to free speech and open discussion, then their path is clearer. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, and, and I think like a lot of just like really earnest people don't grasp this dynamic and see how they are exploited by some bad people um, to give them Okay, let's have our simultaneous sip. This is uh, crystal light orange banana strawberry. So good. Now, this Will Wilkinson philosopher, journalist guy, he has often been a proponent of cancel culture. He's been glad to see people canceled for, for saying things that are politically incorrect, like uh, that uh, Jason guy who did a PhD at Harvard in, on immigration and IQ, Jason Richwine, Will Wilkinson was glad to see him canceled. And ironically, Will Wilkinson got canceled for a joke that didn't land right a couple of months ago. M cover for genuinely shitty stuff. Yeah, and I think you'll want to emphasize that you're not saying that uh, Scott is one of the absolutely not actors. But I think, but I think his platform has been. Um... Okay, and when he says genuinely shitty stuff, I think if he was being philosophically sound, he would have to admit that. Uh, that which he regards as genuinely shitty is entirely a subjective leap of faith on his part. There's no objective standard for what is shitty. Um, exploited by people with some really dangerous ideas. And the thing is, like, I, I like a lot of critics of the, you know, of the piece. No, I don't think it's a great piece. But like, look, like, think about it for a second, though. Like, this dude wanted to write a story. No ill will. He, he talks to Scott Alexander. He's like, hey, I'm gonna write a story about you. And he's like, uh, you know, I want to be anonymous. Can't use my name. And he's like, uh, you know, the rules are that I have to use your name. Now, it seems like nobody actually knows what the rules are. Like, mm -hmm. that seems completely true. And I think it's hard to know because there are so many different kinds of circumstances. I think it's hard to have a, a general rule about when you should uh, accept. Will, uh, will Luke Ford accept the DNA altering vaccine? Stay tuned. The answer may shock you. And the answer is yes. Yes, I will accept it. I'll accept it today. Don't drink the crystal knock light. <laughs> Ford never disavows a supplement, bro. <laughs> Boy, it's tough checking in on the left. A subject's request to remain Believe anonymous. Believe me, it's worth it. Um, because that's, uh, that can't be your default as a journalist, that if somebody that you talk to who is the subject of the story says they don't, you don't, want, they don't want you to use their name, mm -hmm. like, like you can't do your job if you're not using people's names. And, and the thing is, like, also, you know, Scott's real name was super easy to find, so he hadn't concealed it that well, so it's not like it was like a, a real big secret. So he wanted to write the story. He, said, he, he told the guy, I think, just thinking that he's, he's following the rules, that, oh, I, like, I, I can't guarantee you that I can keep you anonymous. Scott just flips his fucking wig. And like kills his entire website, this giant archive of stuff. And his followers go absolutely apeshit. And some of them like literally freaking like, you know, like try to cancel Cade Metz, right? Like he's getting a world of shit, right? Like if you saw those quotes. Okay, so Cade Metz is the New York Times journalist. Uh, Scott Alexander Siskin is the psychiatrist who wrote the blog Slate Star Codex. And then in July of 2020, Scott Alexander deleted the whole blog because the New York Times wanted to write an article about him. He thought that if he just deleted the, the blog, that it would remove the incentive for the New York Times to write an article about him. So here's the, the basic timeline on the Slate Star Codex controversy. So in June, a New York Times journalist wants to write an article about Scott Alexander and Slate Star Codex and this online community. Then Scott Alexander doesn't want the repercussions of that. So a lot of the loathing of the media and the loathing of, of journalists is simply 
a loathing of reality, that you've been publishing all sorts of things which, if more widely known, would threaten your well-being. Well, is that really the fault of those who would bring to more public attention things that you have already decided for years to make public, right? Sometimes just fear and loathing of journalism is just fear and loathing of reality. They are going to bring to more public attention things that you've already decided to make public. So you don't want to face that you feel threatened, that your own well-being feels at risk because of your choices. And so you externalize your anxiety and say, ah, it's all the fault of the New York Times. They won't assure me that they won't use my name. Well, we have, we don't have much of a basis for demanding that other people don't say our name, right? If you fear that exposure of your choices, of your performances in the public square will reveal some things that many people won't like. So I've been blogging for 22 years. I've been blogging almost daily for over three years. I've said some things that would get me in trouble if they were published on the front page of the New York Times. But that's not the fault of the New York Times. That's uh, my fault if I'm saying things publicly that I can't handle the repercussions of. So Scott Alexander's community reacted by viciously going after the New York Times. And so the New York Times then would be logically and morally justified in a suspicion that there are dark sides to you and to your community and then writes that as part of its story. I, am, I have some responsibility for how you behave, certainly in the chat, because I can ban you if you become antisocial. When, when people freak out about exposure for things that they've been doing publicly, they create a self-fulfilling prophecy where the exposure becomes incredibly damaging and they fueled that. So there's an easier route. No, it's Elizabeth Spears. You used to write for Gawker. There's an easier route than summoning an army of bots, opposition researchers, dark enlightenment warriors to go after journalists whose work you don't like said, pay careful attention to what is it that you're afraid that people are going to write about you and ask yourself why you would not want it made public. Then apply some rational thinking. Have some understanding of why you wrote what you wrote. Have an ability to explain it to, say, those who don't have a strong opinion. Right? There are obviously always going to be people who hate what you're saying and nothing you say will ameliorate it. But I try to perform my work my, my vlogging, my blogging with the perspective of the public interest. So I, I try to do things that are in the public interest. And if, if I'm asked, why did you say this and do this, that, that's going to be the explanation. That's the, the motive. What's from, um, you know, Balaji, I'm going to try to pronounce his last name. Um, uh, you know, like he's a really powerful person in, in, in Silicon Valley. And he's like, basically, saying like we can try to make life a complete nightmare for that was like a creepy this. quote I, I am i am prepared to say that unless that was a complete misquote or taken out of context uh that guy has some apologizing to do. i don't remember his name either but it was a creepy quote about how we you know basically like we can sick our dogs on reporters we don't like and make their lives miserable he's a really really important person in silicon valley I, is it Shr 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 That's I, I something like that it's in, it's in the piece it's in the new york times piece it's it's yeah. uh it's it's uh not as bad i'm bad, bad at pronouncing the name um but but that's not fake um kate metz got a world of shit for even wanting to write a story and just saying that he didn't, couldn't guarantee that he wasn't going to use his name. Funny thing, Scott's kind of initial post in his, you know, in his new incarnation of his blog. What, what's it called again? Astral Codex Tannen. People Astral should Codex go there and read his reply to the New York Times piece. Um, but before that, read his initial post, which gets into the original story. And this is why Scott's so great. He effectively acknowledges that, that Kate Betts didn't do anything wrong. Mm -hmm. That he overreacted because he was afraid of what would happen to him. Um, and he just like did that. Like he took this huge... You know, he, he nuked his site, right? Nobody was asking him to do that. Like, he, like nobody was actually threatening him. Um, it's just like a journalist. Yeah, he wrote this before this New York, the yeah, New York Times piece finally came out. It, it, so in 2006, Will Wilkinson said positive things about Steve Saylor. He wrote, uh, Steve Saylor is a smart, challenging thinker. I find benefit from reading him even when I don't agree with him, which is often. I think Saylor is right that many psychometric studies are simply ignored and the results are politically inconvenient or can be interpreted hurtfully. If he's wrong on methodology or or in the inferences he draws from studies, and I think that's worth arguing about. I also think Steve Saylor understands the high sensitivity of questions of race, and I think the enterprise of seeking truth through discussion would be better served with less iconoclastic posturing from him, which is what I think many find aggravating, but he's worth taking seriously and seriously engaging. So that's Will Wilkinson, December 10, 2006. Now, 
Scott Alexander had many views on uh, human biodiversity and uh, the dark enlightenment that uh, that were very different privately compared to publicly. So publicly, he was always condemning neo-reactionary movement. But privately, he sent off an email where essentially he argued that uh, he agrees with with much of this uh, this dissident perspective. And so his his emails were made public in the last few days. So Scott Alexander publicly condemning much of H human biodiversity, the Steve Saylor perspective, and and Curtis Yarvin mentions Mordbug and and that neo reactionary perspective. But uh, Scott Siskin is simply not being honest about his history with the far right. So Topher Brennan posts a branch of the online far right. They call themselves neo reactionaries, and Scott responded by saying, "Oh, I agree. The people you're thinking of don't have much to value to say." But here are some better examples of neo-reactionary thought. But uh, what he was saying publicly and what he was saying privately were very different. So publicly, he was saying, oh, neo-reactionary HBD, that's a lot of nonsense. But uh, privately, he was saying human biodiversity is probably partially correct or at the least very non-approvably not correct. And there are all sorts of interesting HBD hypotheses which should be strongly investigated. And he adds, I will appreciate if you never tell anyone I said this, not even in confidence. And by appreciate, I mean that if you ever do, I will probably leave the internet forever or seek some sort of horrible revenge. This is in a private email. There's a great discussion of how complicated the the name issue is, and he and you can see that he understands it. Like he he came to be able to see it from the other guy's perspective, right? Like mm -hmm. like he's overcoming some biases, and he like it's a great pose. And but but the, the upshot of it is that he owns some responsibility for what happened, right? Like he flipped out about somebody trying to do their job who wasn't doing anything wrong, and got that person in kind of in a lot of trouble with a lot of people. Um, and then so, but he like his reaction to the piece that got actually got written that was just released was that again he he characterizes it as a hit piece. Because he somehow thinks the Times has it out for him for making them look bad, which again is the same kind of like they don't care, right? Like if you've ever dealt with this like gigantic bureaucratic institution, it like like it, it literally couldn't think more of itself. It like it's kind of unhumiliatable, and uh, and like they're certainly not going to be mad at a no, pseudonymous psychiatrist. It's funny. I mean, I don't think. Okay, so once again, Scott Alexander would say very different things privately than public, and so in this email where he expresses. A uh, great interest and respect for HBD and neo reactionary thinking. He adds, I will appreciate it if you never tell anyone I said this, not even in confidence. And by appreciate, I mean that if you ever do, I will probably either leave the internet forever or seek some sort of horrible revenge. I think he's imagining that this was kind of a negative piece. I think it was. It's not flattering. And I think like, well, what happened to Cade Metz? That's the thing. Well, exactly. Right? Like, like, like well, that is what shows you what the community is actually like. Right. And so people in the community who are complaining about um, like something that didn't seem that positive after Scott Alexander massively overreacts, like whether or not he intended to, his fans dogpiled to this reporter yeah. for no reason, completely unjustly. Um, and you expect the guy who's writing a story about you to not think that that doesn't reflect on the nature of the community? Mm -hmm. That's crazy. Yeah, but I, they're acting like it's unfair for him to like think that it had anything to do with anything. Right. So I, I... Right. If, if you watch this show and you go out and behave in an antisocial way and say you use some of the rhetoric I use on this show, but in a different context and with a different emphasis and it looks absolutely horrible, I, I'm going to get pilloried for that. I... I kind of agree. I mean, Scott has the theory. Somebody put this in his head. He says somebody who's like in the know and understands these things said, well, the Times is going to retaliate now because you embarrass him. It reminds me of how when I was at the New Republic, Mike Kinsley was the editor and we would laugh at how we would get these letters uh, positing these theories about why we did things. And it's like, oh, I see you ran these three pieces. It all falls into place. And we're like, wait, one piece was foisted on us by the owner. The other piece came in in the transom and we had a hold of it. You know, there was like no connection, but people would always do this. And I think I think on the one hand, he's wrong to think the New York Times was reacting to the original controversy and ordered up this hit piece. On the other hand, it wouldn't surprise me if the author of the piece had his attitude toward this group soured by the encounter and may have even without being conscious of, I mean, it may be what you said that he just logically concludes that, hey, these people aren't great. It could also be that, that at a kind of unconscious level, this is retaliation because they made his life miserable. And even if he's doing his best to be objective, 
that's still came through. That's possible too. The thing I don't think happened. I think he's just partly he's trying to explain why this is the kind of group that would would make his life a mess. Yeah. Because Scott Alexander overreacted. Um. That that could be. It, it's uh, you know, it's not. It, it, I would say it's definitely not a favorable uh piece. Uh, sounds like Scott may have legit gripes about indiv individual um sentences, but I, but I think that it was not ordered up by the New York Times. That would be very very unusual. Um. Well, as like like um, there's a great story about all of this in the New Yorker this summer. Um, by Gideon Lewis Krauss. Um, and he, he says, you know, the exact right thing that, that, that like, he's like, I used to work for the New York times magazine and, uh, and just like the idea that somebody would, you know, be like, here's this guy who's popular in Silicon Valley, like get him is just very, very weird. Um, because you know how stories get written is that a reporter gets kind of interested in something and, and like wants to poke around and like ask their editor, Hey, like, I, th I think there's something here. Yeah. You know, should I check it out? Like write something up. Okay. Let's have a look at the chat. It's like when 10 alt writers with 10 followers talk about optics. And uh, Dennis Prager says, neo reactionary over the alt right. Ford Star Codex. Luke de radicalized me. Luke Star Codex absurdum. Luke put me on the right path. Thanks, 40. And uh, yes, Keith Woods just premiered a stream with Josh Neal about his new book on extremism. Half Galicia notes Luke radicalized and de radicalized me all within one show The Path of Panassa. Duvid has shown us the way it is up to us to follow. So the New Yorker did a piece on Slate Star Codex, and it notes that Scott Alexander asked his supporters to remain courteous. So this is important. So if I fill you with incendiary perspectives and then say, but please remain courteous, that's, uh, that's, that's disingenuous. It's like, let's say I try to convince you that the 2020 election was stolen by voter fraud. And then I say, well, please remain courteous. Okay, if I make the case that abortion is murder, and then I tell you but you should treat people who perform abortions with courtesy and civility, that's absurd, right? If, if people are out there committing murder, and I tell you, well, you should treat them with civility and courtesy and not violate the law, that, that part of the message simply doesn't translate, right? Once you make the case that voter fraud determined the 2020 election or may have determined the 2020 presidential election, then all moral restraints are gone. If I can convince you that the performance of abortion is murder, then all moral restraints in reaction to those who perform abortions is gone, right? So I can say, oh, be civil, be law-abiding, be courteous, but that's pointless once I convince you that murder is taking place. Once I make the argument that the election was stolen, then all moral strengths are gone. You're in, in a victim community and there is nothing that you can do that is morally illicit once you believe that abortion is murder or once you believe that the 2020 election, presidential election, may have been stolen. So Scott Alexander said, please remember you are representing me in the Slate Star Codex community and I will be very sad if you're a jerk to anybody. Please just explain the situation. Ask them to stop doxing random bloggers for clicks. You are some sort of important tech person who the New York Times technology se section might want to maintain good relations with. Mention that. Right. So this kind of plea to remain civil after you then give incendiary reasons for people to be outraged just doesn't work. Right. We're all sending mixed messages and it's confusing, but uh, some messages that we send out into the world are far more powerful and overwhelm other messages. So this plea conform with the online persona Scott Alexander has publicly cultivated over the years at Slate Star Codex of a gentle headmaster preparing to chaperone a rambunctious group of boys on a museum outing, but uh, just lends plausible deniability to what he surely knew would, would be taken as incitement. So saying that the 2020 election may have been stolen is inciting to extreme, lawless, antisocial and criminal behavior, saying that abortion is murder. Right. Once you make the, the claim that, that abortion is murder, then there is, there is no response that is off the table. So Scott Alexander's appeal elicited an immediate reaction from his, his followers in Silicon Valley and elsewhere. Within a few days, a petition collected, gathered more than 6,000 signatories, including the cognitive psychologist Steven Pinker, the economist Tyler Cowan, social psychologist Jonathan Haidt, cryptocurrency Vitalik Buterin, the quantum physicist David Deutsch, the philosopher Peter Singer, the open AI CEO Sam Altman, 
People just uh, loved Scott's writing. Former venture capitalist and cryptocurrency enthusiast Balaji Srinivasan. That's the Balaji Srinivasan. That's the guy that Will Wilkinson had a great deal of trouble pronouncing his name. Who has a quarrelsome Twitter personality tweeted three hours after Scott Alexander's post appeared that this example of journalism as a non-consensual invasion of privacy for profit was courtesy of Cade Metz, a technology writer ordinarily given over to enthusiastic stories on the subject of artificial intelligence. And as you can imagine, Scott Alexander's plea for civility went unheeded. So we're always putting in mixed messages into the ether, but some messages are going to be much more powerful than others. And we're going to be much more effective in life when our messages are not at war with each other. You can't incite with your right hand, then plea for civility with your left hand and, and be effective. It's like slamming your foot on the accelerator and the brake at the same time. So Cade Metz and his New York Times editor were flooded with angry messages. Srinivasan turned to address Silicon Valley investors, entrepreneurs, and CEOs, saying the New York Times tried to dox Scott Alexander for clicks. Okay, just mentioning some guy's name is not doxing. It's like Ben Shapiro complaining that Breitbart had doxed it when they simply linked to his California State Bar page where Ben Shapiro was responsible for all the information that was on it. And Ben Shapiro was idiot enough to list his home address. Ben Shapiro chose to list his home ad address on his California State Bar page. So Ben Shapiro doxed himself. But does uh, Ben Shapiro want to face that reality that he doxed himself? No, it's much easier to point the finger at somebody else. So Srinivasan tweeted, what will work is freezing them out. Please commit to not talking to New York Times reporters or giving them quotes. Other prominent figures in Silicon Valley, including Paul Graham, followed suit. He says, it's revealing that so many worry that this will be a hit piece. It's a more dangerous time for ideas now than 10 years ago. The New York Times is less to be trusted. So this atmosphere of danger and mistrust gave rise to a whole spate of conspiracy theories that Scott Alexander Siskin was being doxxed or canceled because his, his support for a Michigan State professor accused of racism, because he'd recently written a post about his dislike for paywalls, because the New York Times was simply afraid of the independent power of the proudly heterodox Slate Star Codex cohort. And the editor's like, yeah, sounds good. Um, and then they go poking around. And sometimes, like in this case, weird shit happens while you're poking around that changes the story. Mm -hmm. um, like, right, like they, 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 because again, in journalism, the subject doesn't stay still. The subject has interest in being presented a certain way. In this case, it was Scott had an interest in not having his identity revealed. Um, and he was, you know, reacted to that danger. But like, and, and uh, the chat says, do the bully not have a right to fight back? Of course they do. But how you fight back is going to make all the difference in the world. Let's say your boss says something bullying to you and you respond by punching him in the face. That's probably not an effective way of fighting back. Right, So there are effective and ineffective ways of fighting back. And sometimes the best thing to do is absolutely nothing. So I was in situations where someone was harassing me and I went to my therapist and I said, should I do this or this? My therapist suggested, why not do nothing? That turned out to be the best advice. This guy who was bothering and harassing me turned out to be a valuable friend who found me a job when I desperately needed a job. So sometimes just doing nothing is the best and often Doing nothing is better than doing something that is self-destructive. So people often can't stand just sitting still. They, they want to lash out to protect themselves, and they, they act in anger, and uh, they don't think about the repercussions of what they're saying and doing. But once he reacted this way, he created a, a newer, more interesting story. <laughs> um, right, yeah. And so like, I, I totally get why he'd want to remain anonymous or... Um, but the thing is, like, I don't think it's this journalist's responsibility ultimately, right? Like, like if you are doing something that you think could get you in huge professional trouble, and you've also done a terrible job of concealing your identity, um, it's not somebody else's fault if somebody comes out and says who you are. And the times, yeah. right? If you are doing things publicly online that you don't want the world to know about, then the problem is not uh, the New York Times wanting to write an article about you. The problem is, how did you end up doing all these things that you want to hide from the world? And uh, where do you think that there will be no consequences for actions and words that you perform publicly? 
did hold off on the piece until he yeah. uh, uh, and, and, didn't publish anything. And it may be that the uh, journalist was in a worse mood than he would the first time around. The, um, I want to read Matt Iglesias in his assessment of this. I think you will not buy this. You've read it. But Matt says that implicit in the New York Times piece is a kind of syllogism. Scott Alexander's blog is popular with some influential Silicon Valley people. That's point number one. Scott Alexander has done posts that espouse views on race or gender that progressives disapprove of. Therefore, in the third uh, part of the syllogism, therefore, Silicon Valley is a hotbed of racism and sexism. I don't think you'd put it that way. I think you'd say the Times accurately picked up on the idea that there were some people in this community uh, who uh, manifest racism and sexism. Uh, and then Scott Alexander was kind of tarred by association with him. Yeah. And the thing is, like, I mean, like, it's not like, you know, Scott is definitely not woke. He, he, he has he has, you know, a very common kind of like anti-woke hostility that is very common just with a lot of liberals who think it's best to just argue things out loud. Um, and but like, I don't think yeah, I don't think. Matt is right about what's going on in the story. I don't think it was that kind of syllogism. Um, like, you just have to get inside the mind of the reporter, right? Like, what? Like, you might think, okay, this weird thing happened. Yeah, reporters are people too. Looking at the uncensored D Live chat, tolerance of the intolerant paradox is junk, bro. How long do our boomers intend to perpetuate this denazification program? I really think they should have given up the ghost in the 1990s. You think they ever ask themselves if they are responsible for causing the cringe dead Nazi bouncers that they then fetch about? I know it isn't actually a vaccine. The WHO says there's a lack of evidence that any of the gene therapies offer vaccine protection. I'd hate to be labeled a kook. I'm feeling pretty unrestrained, bro. The 2016 election was stolen. To me, I just wanted to write a simple story, just inoffensive. I was initially interested in like why this guy was right about coronavirus early on, right? Like, like that just seemed interesting. It seemed like an interesting community. It was interesting that he's popular with all these influential people. Um, and and, and then he tries to start writing the story and he creates this giant controversy that like gets his whole blog nuked and this entire it's a, a good idea, particularly if uh, you could be turned into a public figure to never say anything in an email or a text message that you would not like uh, scrolled across. Uh, the 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 scoreboard at Dodger Stadium, or across the front page of the New York Times. Our community incensed at him, and he's like, "Going, what what happened there?" Well, the first question you'd ask is like, "Why was this guy so fucking scared that people would start scouring his?" Right. If if you're incredibly scared that uh, comments you've made online are going to come back to haunt you, then you should ask why, and you should try to come up with with an understanding or an explanation that will make the most sense to people who don't have a strong position one way or another. So the New Yorker wrote, uh, the proliferation of such elaborate conjectures, conspiracy theories about this ordinary run-of-the-mill New York Times story is hardly commensurate with the vision of Slate Star Codex as a touchstone of patience and disinterest, right? This is the rationalist community. They, they claim to explore things rationally Yet they reacted to the possibility of a New York Times profile in an irrational manner that completely escalated the situation. And it was Scott Alexander's initial account of his exchange with New York Times journalist Cade Metz that seeded this escalation. So Slate Star Codex prioritizes semantic precision, meaning using your words carefully. But uh, Scott Alexander's account is to be taken at its word Cade Metz did not propose to dox Alexander, but simply to de-anonymize him. It seems difficult to fathom that a professional journalist of Cade Metz's experience and standing would assure a subject, especially at the beginning of a process, that he planned to write a mostly positive story. So that was Scott Alexander's supposition, and it was incredibly naive. The business model of the New York Times has very little to do with ch chasing clicks. And uh, no self-respecting journalist would conclude the pursuit of clicks was best served by the de-anonymization of a random blogger. And uh, the author of this New York New Yorker piece says, until recently I was a writer for the New York Times Magazine. The idea that anyone in the organization would direct a reporter to take down a niche blogger because he didn't like paywalls, because he promoted a petition about a professor, or for any other reason is ludicrous. Stories emerge from casual interactions between curious reporters and their overtaxed editors. So this story emerged simply because Cade Metz got an email suggestion that he should write on Slate Star Codex. And so this was just another story for, for Cade Metz. But the rationalists, despite their fixation with cognitive bias, read into the contingencies a darkly meaningful pattern. Scott Alexander 
who's taken on the role of trying to help explain Silicon Valley to itself, was taken up as a mascot and a martyr in the struggle against the New York Times. He was enlisted as a, New York Times was enlisted as a proxy for all the elite gate, gatekeepers, the arbiters of what is and is not okay to say, what is allowed and who is allowed by virtue of their identity to say it. So Scott Alexander has long fretted over the likelihood that the presence of these fringe 